In the previous video, we saw that all prediction tasks have the same basic steps, and we want to split our data into three samples – training sample, validation sample, and test sample. But why do we need a test sample when we have validation set? Why can't we just use the mean squared error that we estimated for the chosen model in the validation set? Suppose that we have two models, model 1 and model 2, and in fact they have the same predictive power. Model 1 generates mean squared error that is distributed according to a random normal variable with mean 5 and standard deviation 1. Model 2 has exactly the same mean squared error process. We take a look at validation set number 1, and in this set of data, model 2 wins, it has the lowest errors. But we look at validation set number 2, or we take a third, fourth, fifth, and so on, we can continue. So if we collect the mean squared errors of the best performing model, we will get some random variable that is distributed not according to the true distribution, not according to just a normal variable with mean 5 and standard deviation 1, but a minimum between the two random processes. And this is the key. So if we have to plot the distribution of mean squared errors of the first model, green line, or the second, we would not be able to discern between the two. But the distribution of mean squared errors of the minimum between the two would have lower mean, so the distribution will be shifted to the left. The bottom line, the expected mean squared error conditional we take the minimum of different mean squared errors of different models is not the same as the expected mean squared error of that model. That is why we need the test set that is untouched by the validation process, by the so, the question you might have is, isn't it wasteful to split data in three equal parts, training, validation, and test sets? Indeed, sometimes we want to split our data and get the test set that is much smaller than the rest of the data. It's okay. But this leaves this amount of data to your training and validation. And suppose you train on half of this data, and then you validate on the second half of the data. What you can do? as well is to train on the second half of the data and then validate on the first half. And then just take the average of the mean squared errors of a model i, how it performs on the validation set while trained on the first half, plus the mean squared errors on the validation set of the first half of the data. We will use this cross-validation technique to choose the model that has the lowest cross-validation mean squared errors in the setting. This is an example of a two-fold cross-validation, because we have split our data into two folds. We could also split our data into five folds. Four of them would be training, so would constitute one training set, and on the fifth portion of the data we validate. Then we move and we take another fold of the data as a validation set, we train the model on the other four and validate on this part, and so on. Then, in this case, cross-validation mean squared errors for model i would be the mean squared errors out of sample in the validation sets across all of the five validation sets. This is an example of five-fold cross-validation. You can generalize to a k-fold cross-validation procedure. The lowest k can be equal to 2, where we just split our data in a half, or k equals to n minus 1 would be the largest number of folds, where we have as many folds as number of observations. And in this case, this kind of a cross-validation is called leave one out cross-validation, because we basically train our model on every single observation except one, and then we see how well it performs to predict one observation at a time, and so on. Now, if we return back to the example that we had from the ISLR textbook of different models at different flexibility points, you remember that the true expected mean squared error would be U-shaped thanks to bias variance trade-off, and some optimal level is somewhere here. It appears that if we uh, use on that data cross-validation, what you would get is that the estimated cross-validation mean squared errors would be almost all the time lower than the true expected mean squared errors. But still, cross-validation is very useful into finding approximately the point where the optimal flexibility model lies. 
So thanks to cross-validation, we can pick the one that minimizes expected mean squared error. Again, you can see you cannot use the measure of the cross-validation error as the measure of the mean squared error, but we can use cross-validation to pick the flexibility of the model that we need.